Okay, so welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ashley Weinheimer. I'm a customer success librarian for McGraw-Hill's Access Science Platform, which is the sponsor for today's presentation on the physics of music with Dr. Andy Piacek. Let me go to my next slide here. Just a quick word on Access Science. Access Science is an authoritative and dynamic online resource it contains high quality reference material covering all major scientific disciplines. An award winning gateway to scientific knowledge, it offers over 10,000 in depth articles on scientific concepts, briefings, and news stories on the latest scientific developments, plus biographies, videos, and exclusive animations. <clears throat> all of the articles on Access Science are written by expert scientists and engineers, including our guest speaker today who authored our article on sound, which you can see in my slide there. That article is currently available as an open access article on the site, so you can head over and check it out. And if you'd like more information on Access Science, you can contact the customer success team at the email listed on the screen. And that email and the link to the sound article will be included in the follow-up email you'll receive as well. So just a few housekeeping things before we get started with the presentation. The webinar is being recorded, so everyone who registered will receive a link to that recording within two days after the webinar. All of your attendee lines are muted, but you do have the option to use either the chat or the Q&A to communicate with me and Dr. Piacek. Um, please use the Q&A option for any official questions that you'd like me to pass along for our Q&A portion, and then feel free to use the chat box to add any other comments that you'd like to share with us or with your fellow attendees. So some of my McGraw-Hill colleagues and I will be monitoring both of those so you can enter questions and comments throughout the discussion at any point. <clears throat> and now I am thrilled to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Andy Piacek, who is an Associate Professor of Physics at Central Washington University, where he teaches courses on a variety of topics and conducts acoustics research with undergraduate students. After receiving a BA in Physics from Johns Hopkins, Andy spent a year applying his programming skills to problems in underwater acoustics at the Naval Research Lab Laboratory in Washington, D.C. This experience motivated him to pursue a graduate degree in acoustics at Penn State, where he studied noise made by collapsing bubbles and developed computer models of sonic boom propagation propagating through turbulence. As a postdoctoral researcher at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, he contributed to efforts to detect nuclear explosions by monitoring sounds in the ocean. In 1997, Andy joined his wife, Lisa, at the Central Washington University, where she is a member of the geology faculty. He developed physics of musical sound as a course for the general education program with the goal of helping students in the arts and humanities develop basic skills in quantitative and scientific reasoning. He supervises student research projects, both experimental and computational, that involve sound, vibration, or wave propagation. Many of Andy's students have presented their work at national meetings of the Acoustical Society of America. Andy and Lisa live in the country, a few miles from campus, where they enjoy easy access to hiking, cycling, and cross-country skiing. And Andy has also used the extra time at home this past year to improve his skills on the guitar and piano. So thank you so much, Dr. Piacek, for being with us today, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Ashley. Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for tuning in. Let's see, do I have my uh, screen shared now? Yep, you're good. Okay, okay. So, what I'd like to do is um, give everyone some um, appreciation for what sound is and to give you a better understanding of what sound is. You might wonder, why do we care? What's, what's the importance of, of understanding sound? Well, I think with, with this audience in mind in particular, um, and this is true for all of us actually, that understanding sound better can just improve your experience listening to just about anything, not just music, but to birds, to other sounds in nature, um, to the sound of your car engine, for example. Understanding 
the connection between the sources of sound and what it is that you're actually hearing, you know, can come in handy. If you hear something a little odd in your car engine sound, it could help you diagnose what the heck's going on with your with your car engine. So it just improves your overall awareness of, of the world if you understand um, some of the, the basic physics of how you're experiencing what you're hearing. And then of course this applies also if you're a musician, a better understanding of sound and how it's produced, how your instrument works can make you a better player. And then this extends to those of you who might be educators trying to teach the next generation of musicians how to better play their instrument or just become more in tune with their instrument, so to speak. Uh, that understanding of sounds, how it's produced, how we hear it translates to how we can communicate to other people, um, how to improve their relationship with their musical instrument. So that's, I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this, this talk of um, why we're, we're kind of taking a little bit of a deep dive into the physics of sound and in particular the sound made by musical instruments. So um, let's start with how we perceive sound. There are, sound is a complicated phenomenon um, and there are some parts of, you know, as we try to, as we listen to sound and then we try to communicate to somebody else what it was that we just heard, there are some things that we can all agree on and then some aspects of sound that are hard to describe and ways in which we might actually kind of disagree on what it was that we just heard. The attributes that we can all agree on, if you put 100 people into a room and you play them two sounds of different pitches, you could guarantee of getting unanimous agreement on which sound had the higher pitch and which sound had the lower pitch. Likewise with loudness, I think we can all agree on comparing two sounds, which one is the louder sound, which one is the quieter sound. And then, of course, there's uh, something maybe we'll take for granted, but something, another important attribute of sound is whether or not it's a steady sound or whether it evolves over time. So an example might be a note played by a musical instrument or, say, the sound of a bird. All right, to navigate back to that page. Okay. All right, so notice how rapidly evolving that, that sound was. So those are three characteristics that we can kind of all agree on. But the characteristics that are a little more difficult for us to agree on in terms of how we describe it and um, even, yeah, would, would we all use the same words, would be this quality that musicians refer to as timbre. So even though two sounds might have the same pitch and the same volume and both be steady sounds, they're clearly different from each other. And a good example of that would be sounds made by different musical instruments playing the same note at the same loudness level. We can tell them apart. And the question is, how can we tell them apart? What kind of words might we use to describe those sounds? So I've got four examples here, and I'll play these for you. And let's see if, as I'm playing them, you can maybe identify uh, what those sounds are, or at least you should be able to tell them apart and if you've got some musical training, you might actually be able to put a name to the musical instrument that's, that goes along with the sound. So I'll, I'll play the four sounds first, and then I'll show you which instruments created those sounds. That's the first sound. So three of those sounds had the same pitch. I'll play them again. This one. It's well, close to that same pitch. Um, but clearly different musical instruments. That was a violin. This one was a flute playing the lower pitch. That was a trumpet. And that was a clarinet. So uh, describing the differences of those timbres is not so trivial. And so a large part of what I want to talk about in this uh, presentation is what tools can we use to help us describe those much more precisely? And these are the tools that physicists need um, in order to get at the, um, the physics of how does a musical instrument make its sound and how can you um, make subtle changes to the sound? How can you make an instrument sound better, for example? 
So again, we can agree on um, certain things, and this is a lot like comparing the taste of food when, or, or wine, for example. We can agree on the basic flavors of salt, sweet, sour, bitter. Likewise, we can agree on which sound is louder, which sound is higher pitched. But when it comes to flavor or timbre, so I, I'm likening timbre to flavor, uh, we often fall back on comparisons. So a label from a bottle of wine might, for example, claim that the, the Chardonnay has aromas of honeyed citrus and white flowers and a struck match, which is an interesting analogy. Um, and likewise with sounds, we, when we're trying to describe timbre, we might fall back to comparisons of things that we're all familiar with usually musical instruments. So reedy, fluty, brassy, buzzy. Okay. As scientists, though, uh, in order to really understand how these sounds differ from each other in terms of timbre, we need a much more precise way of characterizing the sound. We can't rely on words like reedy and brassy. That might be good for casual conversation, but from a scientific standpoint, we need something that's not so subjective, some, something that's more quantitative, something that involves numbers. In other words, we need a way of measuring this stuff. So a little um, diversion into what, you know, how, how can we take those measurements, which means we need to understand what sound is. So really quickly, sound is a mechanical wave that can be heard. That's something that you can hear. Oh, well, still, that, that's con concise, but there's a lot kind of packed into that. And your next question might be, well, what the heck is a wave? So a definition of a wave is a traveling disturbance that carries energy. And I've highlighted the word energy because this is not something that we're often accustomed to thinking about. But a wave is something created by a source moving through some medium. And that medium carries the energy of the source to some other place. So the essential ingredients for a mechanical wave, and I'm stressing mechanical wave because there is another type of wave that we're all familiar with, which is a light wave. And there are many flavors of light. There's visible light, but there's also radio, x-rays. Those are all forms of the electromagnetic spectrum. But sound is a mechanical wave. You need a medium, something like, like air or water or even a solid that does the vibrating. And then, you, of course, you need a source that starts that vibration. Vibrations don't appear out of um, out of nothing, you have to have a source. So an a way of visualizing that would be um, here, we're sort of visualizing a tube of air where the black dots represent little particles of air. On the left-hand side is our source. It's like a piston moving back and forth kind of slowly. And as it moves in, it compresses those dots together. And as it moves out, it kind of stretches them apart. And that compression, your eye can follow the motion of the compression. That's the wave going from left to right. But if you look closely, and, and the red dots are there just um, to help you focus, each particle of the medium is just moving back and forth. And actually what it's doing is mimicking the motion of the source. So at some point further down the pipe, so to speak, uh, we have the air moving just like the source did, but some time passed before, before the wave got there. So the wave is not, air moving from one place to another, the wave moves, but the air itself just stays in place and it oscillates. Now, understanding that that's what a wave is helps us design a way of measuring it. So a microphone measures pressure. It's sensitive to how closely packed the air molecules are or how spread apart they are, that's pressure. And it converts it to a voltage. And if we, having a voltage then lets us um, make a plot. So we put it into a computer and we can plot what's going on. And so in this case, we have very simple motion back and forth. And if we were to plot that motion or plot the pressure, we see this simple sine wave going up and down in a very simple way. And if, the, um, if our source is moving faster back and forth, then that'll show up in the microphone as a signal that's going back and forth more quickly. So what would a sound representation from, a, um, from an actual musical instrument look like? So here's the clarinet again. So that sound 
um, converted into a plot of pressure versus time would look like this. So this is, we call this plot a waveform. So let's look at some other examples of waveforms. Uh, that was a clarinet. How about a saxophone? Or a French horn? All right, they're all the same pitch, um, but they have slightly different timbres. And sure enough, their waveforms look slightly different. But what you probably will notice right away is that they all have in common um, that the waveforms are repetitive. They repeat themselves in a very simple, regular way. And repetitive, another word for repetitive is periodic, which means that there is a, a period for, it, it's cyclical, and each cycle has a period. But if the waveform is periodic, remember back to that animation, um, the medium is only doing whatever the source did. So that's telling us that the source of the sound was also periodic. It was moving in a way, it was vibrating in a way. Um, that was periodic like this. So that's a very important clue. And the other thing that is we're noticing here is that those are sounds with a definite pitch, right? We can hum to it, we can whistle to it, we can say what note that is. And even though there are different timbres, there is a definite pitch. In all the examples that we've seen so far, the sounds with a definite pitch have this periodic waveform. So keep that in mind. Of course, not all sounds are, have a definite pitch. And if we look at their waveforms, we see that they're not periodic. So here's the sound of a gong. It's a musical instrument, but that's not a, that sound is not a note. It's not one definite pitch. Um, as we'll see later, maybe that's really lots of different pitches that are all kind of um, competing for your attention, but there is no one pitch that your ear can grab onto and say, oh, that's an A flat. No, nope, that sound doesn't have a pitch. And if we look closely at the waveform, we see that it's it doesn't really repeat itself. And then a more extreme example would be what we just referred to as noise. So that's, or yeah, that's just the sound of me hissing. And the waveform looks like this. And it's actually quite random looking. Okay, so we get a sense that the waveform tells us something about the timbre of the sound. The more chaotic or random looking it is, the more likely it doesn't have a definite pitch to it. But if it's regular and periodic, then it should have a definite pitch. Okay, well, let's build on that idea. So sounds with a definite pitch have periodic waveforms and a couple more examples here um, with a clarinet and a cello. Different pitches. So I stress the importance of measurement. Uh, what, how can we use this waveform to measure important quantities? So I'm gonna give a, a little table here of the things that we can measure and how they're defined. And <clears throat> this will um, allow us to specify maybe how we can describe these more complicated waves. So the first thing that I've already talked about is this concept of a period. So we have a waveform that repeats itself and the time, so each element or each unit of repetition, we call that a cycle. And the time it takes for one cycle to occur is the period, all right? So in this example of the clarinet, we can see that, the, uh, of course, you can measure the period from any point on the way that you want. You can measure it from the crest. You can measure it from the trough. Um, if it repeats, it's gonna repeat with the same amount of time, no matter where you, you choose. In this example, the period is 2.2 milliseconds. Well, a millisecond is one thousandth of a second. So I could convert that to seconds. I'd have to move the decimal place, the decimal point three places to the left. That's 0 0.0022 seconds. Keep that in mind. On the cello, it's a different value, seven seconds, seven milliseconds, I'm sorry. So 0 0.007 seconds. They, on the screen, they look like they're about the same width. But if you look closely at the scale down here, this goes from 800 milliseconds to 900, whereas this goes from 800 to about 830. So the scale is different. So this is the longer period, and we noticed it had a lower pitch. Okay, so the period of the cycle is one way of taking the measurement. I could sort of conversely ask or measure 
how many cycles fit within one second. And we call that the frequency. So the number of cycles in a second. And obviously those two numbers are related. So using a simple example, if my period were one fourth of a second, clearly there would be four cycles per second. So the way that these two numbers are related to each other is that they're simply the inverse of one another. So the frequency is just one over the period. And remember, if I convert that to seconds, 0 0.0022, put that into your calculator, one divided by 0 0.0022 would get you 460. So that's 460 of these cycles fit into one second. That's the frequency of the clarinet. The cello has a longer period, so fewer of them fit into one second. So it has a lower frequency of 140 hertz. And we heard this as the higher pitch, and this is the lower pitch. So clearly, frequency is the number, a way of measuring what we perceive as pitch. Now, remember, there was another quality of the sound that we can all agree on, and that's loudness. And we measure that as the amplitude, and that simply, basically, how tall the wave is on our waveform. And there are units for that. Measured, if, if we're measuring pressure, the units of pressure is a pascal, in this case, a micropascal. Um, but so how tall the wave is, is amplitude, how many or how long a cycle is, is the period, how many cycles per second is the frequency. These are easily measured numbers. But the timbre, though, is still a, we haven't yet figured out how we can measure timbre, but we're getting there. So let's look at these three examples of sounds. Here's a sine wave. Pure tone. There's a definite pitch, and it's kind of a boring sound. Uh, here's a waveform that looks slightly more complicated, but it has the same period as that, um, as that sine wave. So we expect it to have the same pitch. Okay, already there's something different about it. If we had to hum to it or whistle to it, we'd, we'd agree that it's the same pitch, but there's another, maybe another tone there that's contributing to this, this timbre. And then this much more complicated looking sound, it clearly repeats itself. I mean, there are lots of intermediate cycles, but from here to here is the same period as from here to here. And if you tried to hum along, you'd, you'd agree it's the same pitch as the other two, but it has a much more buzzy timbre. So to summarize, in terms of measurements, the pitch of a sound is, is measured by the frequency of the wave, and all three of these have the same frequency. The loudness is determined by the amplitude, and the timbre, we can see, is related to the complexity of that sound wave. This is the simplest looking of, the sound, of, the, of these waveforms. Um, this is kind of intermediate, and this is the most complex looking, and it has the most complex, rich timbre. So that's a clue to how we're going to be able to describe and measure timbre. So in this process, let's make an analogy of sound to light, because I think we're all familiar with the idea that white light can be broken up by a prism, and we can see that it has constituent colors or wavelengths. In the same way, a complicated sound is also has components. And just like with light, we can talk about the wavelengths of those components, but we're more accustomed to using the term frequency. So the idea is that a complicated sound, a sound coming from a violin or a clarinet, actually has component frequencies. And the tool, we don't have a prism so much uh, or anything that operates exactly like a prism for sound. But what was discovered by uh, Hermann von Helmholtz back in the 1850s and 60s was this idea that you could isolate one particular component from a sound by using a resonator. So a resonator is um, pretty much like a, a bottle, so a bottle like this. And the, the key features of a bottle are that you have this cavity and you have a neck. And the air in the neck acts like a mass and the air in the cavity acts like a spring. And most of you probably have seen the effect of just hanging a weight on a spring it oscillates with one specific frequency. In fact, if you were to plot that motion, you would get the motion of a sine wave. So this is what's happening to the air inside of a, of a bottle or something that's got a neck and a cavity. And so Helmholtz designed these things. He added one other little aperture here, which is where you could put your ear, but this is the neck, here's the cavity. 
And the idea is that that would resonate. So if, if that, so each one of these is tuned to a particular frequency. And if that frequency was present in the sound that you're trying to analyze, it would ring a little bit louder. And you could tell, ah, the sound I'm hearing has that component. It has the component of whatever frequency this is tuned to. And he had a whole set of those. So he was basically decomposing the sound into individual tones. So for example, this bottle here mm -hmm. has, has that particular tone. And uh, I can also demonstrate with, with a guitar um, that this happens. I should also point out that your mouth is basically a fancy Helmholtz resonator. And there's a quick little demonstration that I want to do to um, convince you of that. And it's something that you can do at home as well. So first, I just want to emphasize that a guitar has a built-in resonator and that my the sound of my voice has many different component frequencies. And if one of those frequencies matches the, the, the frequency that this guitar is tuned to, you should hear it ring out a little bit. And let's see if I can uh, remember the, the, the pitch that it wants to do that. Ah, 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 ah. So I don't know if you heard it ring a little bit more in the, in the guitar when I did that. But your mouth also is a resonator. And here is the source of sound, a, an electric razor. Mm. There is a pitch to it, and it's got that same buzzy, hummy, um, timbre that we, we saw in another example, which tells me that the sound of this is probably periodic. It has a definite pitch, but it has probably lots of components to it. And if I can tune my mouth as a resonator to match the components of this, I should hear it ring out a little bit. So I can do what Helmholtz did with my mouth. Let's see if I can do that. I well, hope you're able to hear that. Um, sounds good to my ears, but I'm not quite sure how it translated into the microphone. Yeah, that came through so, really well, Andy. We could hear it. Excellent. Okay. So uh, go back to sharing the screen. Um, try that at home. That's a uh, electric razor works well just because it has a lot of components to it, but other other um, sources of sound might work just as well. Okay, so there's a corollary idea that if you can decompose sound into component tones or pure tones, uh, we should also be able to build up um, a complicated sound using these sine wave components. Because sine waves are the, um, the plot of a, of a single frequency tone. All right, to really appreciate that, let's consider what happens when, you know, how, how can we add waves? What happens when, when waves meet up? So consider the sound from a barbershop quartet, um, and you want to record that sound, right? You've got four different sources of sound. You've got the sound from the bass. You've got the sound from the tenor. You've got the sound from the lead. You've got the sound from the baritone. And you've only got the one microphone or the one ear. What actually happens? Well, the microphone's only going to measure, it's going to trace out only one plot of pressure versus time. And what it, that plot has to be the sum of all the different sources. So they simply add up. So even though you've got four different sources at any given location where those waves meet, you simply add up the, 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 um, the, the, the sound pressures of each of the four, the four different waves. And we can visualize this. And the same thing happens when two waves, say in water or two waves on a string meet up, they simply add up and the two waves just pass right by each other. But when they overlap, they simply add. So the dark line is what you actually see the string do. And the red and blue dashed lines are just helping us visualize the components of those two things. So real quickly, um, we could graph those things uh, to help us understand better this idea of adding up waves. So there's a blue sine wave and a green sine wave. They have the same period, the same frequency. One has a different amplitude. And if I simply add them up mathematically, I get the red wave. And the red wave is going to have the same frequency as the two components, because the two components have the same frequency. But the amplitude is taller, 
And that's because in this particular example, the blue wave was kind of in phase with or in sync with the green wave. When one was up, the other one was up. And when you add the two, you get a bigger number. With waves, that doesn't always happen. This process of adding up waves, by the way, is called superposition. And we, we see that if, if the components have the same frequency, the result has to have the same frequency. In this example, though, my two components are sort of out of phase of each other. When one is up, the other one is down. They have different amplitudes, though. And when I add them up, um, the green wave is a bigger amplitude than the blue wave. So the result is something that's still positive. Uh, but overall, this red wave now has a smaller amplitude than it did before. This is an example of uh, destructive interference, where one component partially cancels the other one. And of course, here's an example of the same idea, but now I've just adjusted the amplitudes of my two components to have to be the same. They're still out of phase of each, with each other. If I were to add those up at every moment in time, if I add the value of the green to the value of the blue, what do you think would happen? They would exactly cancel each other out. And in fact, this is the mathematical, physical idea behind noise canceling headphones, is that uh, your, your headphone has a microphone, it detects the incoming sound, and it generates the opposite wave that's out of phase to cancel it by the time it reaches your ear. Now, it's a very simple idea with, with sine waves. In real life, when you're listening to noise and, and talking sounds that are changing with time with, with many different frequencies, it's much more complicated. But in principle, that's what you can do. Here's another example of adding up sine waves that involves both constructive and destructive interference. So let's say my two components are slightly different in frequency. In this example, I have a 10 hertz wave and an 11 hertz wave. And at the beginning, they're in sync, they're in phase, but because they have different frequencies, as time goes on, they get out of phase. But if you go a little further in time, they get back in phase again, and then they get out of phase, and they go in phase. So they alternate being in phase and out of phase and in phase and out of phase. And the red wave in this picture shows you what the resultant would look like when you simply add those two together. Because remember, that's what the microphone is going to detect. That's what your ears are going to detect. They're only going to hear the the resultant, the sum. And what we see here is that uh, where there's destructive interference, the amplitude of my resultant wave is very small. And where I have constructive interference, the amplitude is much bigger. And it, it oscillates. Well, the amplitude oscillates. Uh, this oscillation corresponds to the pitch that we hear, but this oscillation corresponds to something else. It's a fluctuation in loudness. And we call that beating. And since it's periodic, we can define a period. We can, we can measure how long it takes for that beat to happen, which means we can calculate a frequency. We call it the beat frequency. And there's a simple, useful calculation to predict what the beat frequency will be. If you know the frequencies of your components, it's simply the difference. So in this case, 11 hertz minus 10 hertz gives me one hertz, and that's the beat frequency. So here are a few more examples. That's the, the same 10 hertz and 11 hertz. I can do the same thing with 51 hertz and 50 hertz, right? The component frequencies are much different, but the difference is still one hertz. And so it's still, um, the, the beating takes just as long as, as uh, in the previous example. If I change my two components so that they differ by two hertz, then the beat happens twice as often. And if I change it so that the difference is three hertz, then I get three beats per second, whereas I only had one beat per second before. So again, the difference of the components gives you the beat frequency. And this is only really noticeable when their components are very um, close to each other. So that if the difference is less than about 20 hertz, you will hear it as beating. So here's an example that's more audible. So we'll start with the, um, the slow example of um, 500 hertz and 510 hertz. So you'll hear a pitch. That's kind of the average of those two frequencies, but you're gonna hear beating that's the difference between those two numbers, 10 hertz. So 10 times per second, um, you'll hear something fluctuating. All right, so you heard the wah, 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 wah. And that wah, wah, wah is happening 10 times a second. I'm gonna slow it down now. Um, so the difference here is only five hertz. So the beat frequency should only be five times per second. 
wah, 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 but it was slower. And now it's only one second, so it's a very slow beat. Right, so that's what beating sounds like. And that's actually a very useful tool for musicians who are tuning their instruments, for example. If they want to get, if they want to tune to another instrument or if they want to tune two strings on their guitar, um, they listen for beating and they tune it so that the beating gets slower and slower and slower until they don't hear it anymore. Then they know that they have something in tune. Okay, so here's this. We've got this idea that by adding up sine waves of different frequencies, we can get more complicated waves. Let's look at the special case where the frequencies of my components are all integer multiples of some base frequency. And that base frequency we'll call the fundamental, and those other components we will call harmonics, which is just a fancy word for being integer multiple. So as an example, and by the way, these symbols here are just helpful for us to keep track. Physicists love to have symbols. So F stands for frequency. F1 is the first frequency in the list, so that's the fundamental. And then N can be any integer, two, three, four, five. So let's say my fundamental is 220 hertz. So F1 is 220 hertz. Well, then the second harmonic is two times that, so 440 hertz. The third harmonic is three times that, 660, and so on. All right? So this is called the harmonic series. But the interesting, or the, the reason this is a special case is that when I add up these frequencies, when I add to the sine waves of these frequencies, um, the period is always going to be this, the period of the fundamental, which means the frequency is going to just be the frequency of the fundamental. So we hear that as a definite pitch. We will hear the pitch of the fundamental, but the presence of those harmonics does not change that frequency, but it does change the timbre. So here I'm adding, um, so the fundamental is a sine wave, that's in green. And here I'm adding um, an extra, I'm adding the second harmonic to that. And the combination is shown by the red wave, but the, I'm also showing the fundamental in green just for comparison. And you see that they have the same period. And the same goes for three harmonics or for five harmonics. I'm not changing the period when I do that. And I'm going to, um, let's see, I'm going to switch over to this wonderful um, website. This is a, a physics demonstration um, called FET, P-H-E-T. And if you just Google that, you get access to lots of wonderful um, interactive physics simulations. This one helps you visualize what happens when you add sine waves that are harmonics to each other. And I can change the amplitude by this little bar here. So what I have right now is a fundamental. And I, this, this bar, right now it's at zero, but this represents the second harmonic. This is the third harmonic, the fourth harmonic. Right now they're all at zero. If I add in some of the second harmonic, if I change the amplitude, right, that's represented by the orange curve. So I can see both the fundamental and the second harmonic the sum is represented down here below, and I'm going to zoom out a bit so I can just see more of it. Just confirm that it's periodic. And if I add in some of the third harmonic, I can see all three of them, and I can see what the effect is here, down below, and so on. And you know, I, I can radically change what it looks like as, as I change the amplitudes of these harmonics. But what I can't change is the period of my resulting wave. So the presence, I'm gonna re reiterate, the presence of harmonics never changes the pitch, but it does change what you're hearing. It changes the timbre. Now we have a, a pretty good physical understanding of where timbre comes from. It's how much of each harmonic is present in a sound. So sounds have components, and if those components are harmonics, if they are multiples of some base frequency, then we will get a sound with a definite pitch and the timbre is gonna be related to how much of each harmonic we have. Here's another audio example of that. So here's a simple sine wave of a particular frequency. And I will play these in rapid sequence, but you'll hear what it sounds like when I add in the second harmonic and the third harmonic and the fourth harmonic and I'm choosing very specific amplitudes for those. The second harmonic will have an amplitude of one half, whatever the fundamental had. The third harmonic will have an amplitude of one third. 
whatever the fundamental had and, and so on. So I'll start this again. hear the tone of each new harmonic but if i just but now that some time has passed and if i just play that by itself i think you'll just hear a tone with some timbre but you're not going to be able to pick out the individual harmonics anymore harmonics as you it gets and notice what's happening to the waveform with this particular recipe for the sound choosing harmonics, but I'm choosing the amplitudes of those harmonics in a particular way. When I add them up, um, I go from a sine wave to something that's looking very angular. In fact, we call that a sawtooth wave. Uh, this is an example of a square wave where I'm skipping all the even harmonics. I'm only adding odd harmonics. So the first, the third, the fifth, but the amplitudes follow the same rule. So they sound like this. sawtooth wave. And I want to show you the same um, idea now applied to an actual, well, some examples of actual musical instruments. So what I've done here is I've taken the recorded sound of a cello and I've decomposed it into its harmonics. And I'm going to play the first 15 harmonics in sequence. So you'll hear what the individual tones sound like. And then the second time I'm going to play them again, but now I'm going to layer them on top of each other. And then lastly, I'll just play the, the, the full sound. So here's the sound of the first 15 harmonics of a cello. All right. So each, each of those was a, a pure tone, single frequency. They, those are the harmonics. Now I'm going to play them again in sequence, but I'm going to add them. I'm going to layer them on top of each other, starting with the fundamental. You may have noticed that by the time I got to the end of the, the 15th harmonic, it was starting to sound a bit like a cello. So the more harmonics I added, the more cello-like the sound became. But 15 harmonics really doesn't do justice to the, the sound of a real cello. Right? That's still much richer than, so there, there are more than 15 harmonics in the cello sound. I was just playing the 15. So let's do the same thing with the trumpet. Now the pitch of the trumpet is higher, so each of the harmonics being multiples of that will also be higher. They're going to go up quite high. And then layer them. And then by comparison, the full sound of the, the trumpet wasn't too bad. And one more, this is the, the piano. Now I've taken the full piano sound and I'm playing, I'm just going to do the layering and each one will be a separate uh, audio file. So here's the sound of a piano with just the fundamental. And then I'll play what it sounds like when you have the first two harmonics and then the first three harmonics and so on. And I'll play them rapidly enough so that your ear, as it, you know, as it's uh, comparing the, the, the sound you're hearing with the one it just heard is sensitive to the addition of the new harmonic. And you can probably kind of hear that. I'll play that last one again. This is just six harmonics, the first six harmonics of the piano. So it doesn't sound too much like a piano yet, maybe a very cheap synthesized version. Compare that to the full sound. But you get the idea. If I kept going with, with more harmonics, we would get there. So I hope that convinces you that the sounds of musical instruments are made up of these component sounds that are harmonics. Um, real quickly, what I showed you with that um, FET animation um, helps us realize how we can represent this idea that sounds are made up of components. So I was adjusting the amplitudes of harmonics with that little bar. Um, and we can think of that, well, along this axis is like a, a frequency axis. This, this represents frequency, and this represents amplitude. 
So a bar graph of what I wound up with is a way of representing basically the recipe of this sound where the waveform is down here. So in that case, it was a sawtooth wave. Notice I have one, one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, and so on, just the first five harmonics, right? And we can visualize those components there. And this is like a, a bar graph of what I've just created. So the y-axis is uh, amplitude, the x-axis is frequency, and I'm representing frequency by the, the number of the harmonic. In this case, I got a period of 2.27 milliseconds. And if you go one over that, you get 0.44, but that's in kilohertz, which is 440 hertz. So that's concert A, which means that's the frequency of my fundamental. So 880 was the frequency of the second harmonic and so on. And um, that waveform looks like this. And this plot then, I'm going to show you, it, it's analogous to a bar chart. But when you actually use a computer to calculate using this, the, the, the waveform, the recording from the microphone, you can do a mathematical operation that pulls out the components. And you would get a plot that looks like the red one that's underneath. But I've, I've superimposed that on top of the bar graph to help you appreciate that what we're looking at when we see this other plot here is how much of each component, how much of each harmonic do we have in our sound? And then we call that plot a spectrum. So here's the sound of a horn, and here's what the spectrum of the horn looks like. So the period in that case was 2.1 milliseconds with a frequency of 470 hertz. And the spectrum has the fundamental there at roughly 470 hertz. And then the second harmonic at double that, the third harmonic at three times that, and so on. This plot, this frequency plot, is the most useful tool for people who want to analyze sounds. So these are some examples of, of the various sounds and what those plots look like. And we can see that, you know, in some cases, you don't always have all the harmonics. Like the square wave had only the odd harmonics, and that shows up in the spectrum. Um, not all sounds, you know, sounds that aren't periodic, like this, sort of like a gong, it's a metal bowl. Maybe your ears can, can almost pick out the various frequency components that are in there, but they're kind of competing with each other because they're not harmonically related, they're not integer multiples. And we can see that in the spectrum. The tall peaks tell us which frequencies are the loudest, but there are these other frequency components in there. And they're not evenly spaced, so they're not harmonics. They're unrelated to each other. There is no fundamental, so we don't hear a definite pitch. And, and for example, or beyond that, we can see that there are cases where there are two frequencies really close to each other that would produce beating, which we could probably hear. And then other pairs of frequencies that are further apart, but they sort of produce a harsh tone. So, real quickly, comparing the sound to the spectrum. So here's the saxophone. This is a B flat, a single reed instrument. Um, notice the, the, the pattern of how loud each harmonic is compared to the oboe. Right? Different timbre, same pitch. Well, no surprise, the, the fundamental is the same in both of those cases. But the pattern of amplitudes is quite different, whereas the saxophone had a fundamental that was by far the tallest peak, and the second harmonic is much lower. In the case of the oboe, it's actually the third harmonic that was tallest, and that contributes to having you know, a different timbre. No surprise, they're constructed slightly differently. The oboe is a double reed, the saxophone is a single reed, and that shows up in the the, the timbre and the, and the spectrum that we're looking at. So just to confirm, pitch is determined by the frequency of the fundamental and the timbre is determined by the relative amplitudes of the harmonics. So in a bassoon, lower pitch, right? This is on the same scale here. Um, notice how these are, um, the spacing between my peaks here tells me what the fundamental is. These peaks are all much more closely spaced. In fact, it's half the spacing. So the Pitch is half the, um, 
the, the fundamental is half the frequency in the case of the bassoon that was for the oboe. And I think we'll hear a difference in the pitch. It's an octave lower. I can do that with some other instruments. And then also just for sounds uh, that aren't, that don't have a definite pitch. Um, I'll, this sound has all three of these sounds. That's a shh. I don't Notice that the this sound has more energy in the higher frequencies than the shh did, and the whisper had most of its energy in the really low frequencies. So even with noises, by looking at the spectrum, we can say something about what they're going to sound like. Um, maybe a couple more minutes. I want to show you some um, useful. Uh, videos here. Oh, that one's not going to show. Okay, so we don't have to do that one. Um, this is a, a, a recording I took. So I will briefly explain to you where do harmonics come from? They come from the source. And so in, for a lot of musical instruments, the source is a vibrating string. Why do vibrating strings give us harmonics? This is a standing wave given a string. This particular standing wave has two nodes here and here. Nodes are where the string is not moving very much. It also has three anti-nodes here, 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 which is where the string has maximum displacement during its vibration. On either side of the node, the string is moving in opposite direction. Between any two consecutive nodes, is half of a wavelength. And so across two antinodes from one node here to this node here is one full wavelength. In order to have a standing wave in a string, which is fixed at both ends, you need to have an exact number of half wavelengths or an exact number of antinodes that fit inside the length of your string. So this particular standing wave has three half wavelengths that fit in the string. And I am making the standing wave occur at 36 hertz. So my source over here, the little shaker going up and down, is going up and down 36 times per second. If I decrease the frequency, then I will increase the wavelength in the string. This is a property of waves. But if I make the distance between nodes longer, if I make the half wavelength longer, then I won't get exactly three fitting into my length of my string anymore. So if I decrease the frequency just a little bit, I no longer have a standing wave. But if I continue to decrease the frequency to another special frequency, in this case, about 24 hertz, then I have another standing wave. And once again, I have an exact number of half wavelengths that fit inside the length of my string. In this case, I have two half wavelengths, which are identified by the two antinodes. And there is one node in the center. So this occurs at 24 hertz. The standing wave with three antinodes occurred at 36 hertz. And you can imagine if I continue to decrease the frequency, once again, uh, my wavelength will not fit. I won't have an exact number of half wavelengths fitting in the length of my string. But you should be able to predict that I can still get one more exact number of half wavelength. I can get one half wavelength that fits. If 36 hertz corresponds to three antinodes and 24 hertz corresponds to two antinodes, it should come as no surprise that the wave, the frequency at which I can get a wave with exactly one half wavelength or one antinode and no nodes occurs at 12 hertz. This is as low as I can go and still have a standing wave. This is as low as I can go and still have a standing wave. If I go any lower, uh, I, I once again, I will not have any standing wave, but I can't have less than one half wavelength. So this is the lowest frequency at which I can get a standing wave. And clearly, the other standing waves are all integer multiples of this one. So 12 hertz, 24 hertz, 36 hertz. There is nothing to stop me from going higher. 
So let's see what happens at the fourth multiple of 12 at 48 hertz. We can predict that we should have four antinodes. Like this. Okay, so I'll stop the video there. So that demonstrates where the harmonics come from. They are the allowed frequencies that a string can vibrate at. And this also is, applies to a tube of air and so on. And I've, I've got really just one more um, quick little demonstration. I'm going to um, stop sharing. Because I was shaking that string at a particular frequency just to get, you know, to isolate a, a certain pattern of vibration. But when you pluck a string, like a guitar string, then what's going on? I'm not, I'm hearing a very rich sound. I know that there are lots of harmonic components to that. But if a string only vibrates with those patterns, then what a string must be doing when I'm plucking it is that it's vibrating with all of those patterns simultaneously. And I can prove that because if, remember about nodes and antinodes, there are places where the string doesn't want to vibrate. So if I touch the string at a node, I'm not going to interfere with that particular pattern of motion, but I might suppress the other ones. So um, you remember that the second harmonic, the one that had the two, um, the two antinodes and the one node in the middle, if I, um, if I put my finger there after plucking the note, I'm going to suppress the fundamental, the one that has no nodes, and I'm also going to suppress the third harmonic because it also had an antinode in the middle. In fact, all the odd harmonics that have an antinode in the middle, I'm going to suppress those by touching the middle of the string. And all I'm going to be left with is the second harmonic, but also the fourth harmonic and the sixth harmonic because they all have nodes in the middle. What would that sound like? The sound is an octave higher, which is a ratio of two to one, so it's the it's the frequency of the um, of the second harmonic. If I touch it at a place that's one third of the way, I should hear the third harmonic and all the multiples of three. If I touch it at a place that's a fourth of the way, I should hear the fourth harmonic and all of its multiples. That's two octaves, and and so on. So there are. Um, this is how people generate harmonics on a guitar, which is a useful effect in performing, but it's also a great demonstration of how strings vibrate. And I'm gonna stop there because we are right at 10.59 and I hope there's still time for uh, a couple questions. So I'll come back. Thank you, that was very fascinating and I loved all the demonstration. That was really great. And we do have a few questions. So if anyone has to jump off the call, um, you will be getting a recording of this after the presentation. So if you want to see the answers to your questions there, um, and we'll just stick around for another few minutes to answer some of these questions. So I'll just read them out to you here. So one was by putting together the different harmonics, like we're showing that, um, is that what makes playing different instruments on a single electric piano possible? So an electric piano, there are different ways that electric pianos operate, and it's changed over the years. Um, a common way for electric pianos to operate now is that you've got pre-recorded samples of actual musical instruments. And then you can manipulate, once you've stored that electronically, you can manipulate them to get different pitches, to get different tam So they're all stored as different files. So if you, if you want to switch between a, um, a different timbre on your electric piano, you're actually just switching between different pre-recorded sounds. Um, but the early days of electronic music were fascinating because they really did build their sounds using sine waves. They had the old-fashioned electronic oscillators. And if you've ever seen a Moog synthesizer, you know, it took up a big room. It looked like a giant computer with cables patching in all these different, um, different directions. You should Google Wendy Carlos and you'll see an example of this. Um, they had to make their sounds the, the hard way by, by building up the components. It's interesting to hear. There was another question about sampling in here, so you answered that one. Um, there was a question earlier when we were talking about the beating of music and if there's any sort of application of that in medicine, like with heartbeats. The, 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 
the closest application, well, one very important application of sound in medicine is ultrasound. So waves that are um, much higher in frequency, much higher than we can hear. We can hear up to 20 kilohertz. But if you have sounds that are in the megahertz range, um, very short wavelengths, and the sounds propagate through your body. And then when they hit something that changes, so the, the different your different tissues in your body, um, sound propagates through them differently, which means when the sound hits it, it, some of it reflects, some of it keeps going and some of it reflects. And that's how you can basically image what's in your body is by using sound and, and very carefully mapping the reflections that you get. That doesn't involve beating per se, but it is a great example of how you can use sound in ways that doesn't involve listening. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, and there was another comment in here about the relationship between music and emotional reactions. And if you have any comments there, you know, you have different emotional reactions to sound. There's, yeah, well, there's a whole field of study about how people respond to music. And to be honest, that's not my field of study. Um, I'm the physicist. So I'm interested in the, the, how sound propagates, how the sound is created by an instrument, how it gets from the instrument to your ear, and a little bit in terms of how your ear processes that sound. But there's still another um, amazing world of how your brain interprets the sound that comes from your ear and then how that stimulates the various parts of your brain in terms of emotional reactions. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but I know it is, it's a field of study. A lot of people think about that. Okay. And have you done any research or know of any research on the acoustical properties of specific musical instruments? So I'm currently doing a study on violins, which could, it's just standing in for other stringed instruments, but um, we've got some violins in particular. And the question I want to answer is uh, addressing, which is a common, I don't want to call it a trope, but a, a, a common belief among professional string players is that a brand new, I'll, I'll keep using violin as an example, a brand new violin will not sound as good as one that's been played for a while. You need to kind of break it in. And this is universally believed as far as everyone I've ever interviewed who, who's a professional violinist. But we don't have a good understanding of why that is, or even has this actually been measured? This is all perceptual. And there are a lot of confounding factors that go into why you might think it's gonna sound better. So I'm trying to, with my students, um, nail down exactly what's changing. So we have three brand new violins that are on loan to us um, from a local violin shop. And one of them is gonna be a control. We're not gonna do anything to it. It'll just stay in tune, stay in the same room as the other two. But with the other two violins, we're going to artificially play them. We're just gonna stimulate them in the same way that they might be, but we can do it 24 seven, just mechanically. So kind of speed up the process. And every once in a while, we'll take out all three violins and we'll do these tests to characterize how those violins are behaving. In other words, we wanna take measurements. And if we can measure changes that are systematically changing as those two get played, that will be some confirming evidence that yeah, something is going on. Uh, and then that'll be a clue towards, okay, well, what is going on? What's causing it? Uh, everyone's got lots of hypotheses. Is it the varnish? Is it the cracks in the varnish? Is it you know, other things going on? Is the wood changing? But um, yeah, so that, that's, our, that's our goal is to try to answer that question. Yeah, that's great. So everyone too, that sounds like some fascinating research. So be sure to um, follow Dr. Piacek and you'll see the results in that when they come out. Um, so I want to just thank everyone for attending today. Um, again, if you have any questions on access science or if you have any questions that you want me to pass along to Dr. Piacek, you can certainly email those to me. You'll be getting my email address in the follow-up as well as the link to the article on sound um, and some other information. So thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you all enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. And thank you again, um, Dr. Piacek, for doing this presentation with us. Yeah, well, thank you guys for hosting this and thanks to everybody for tuning in.